Josh told his sister Kate that he was going out for a walk. He never came back. He's never been away for so long. Something's wrong. When the builders broke down the chimney, they found Josh's remains stuck inside. Can you imagine losing your son for seven years, then finding his remains in the chimney of a cabin in the woods? What would go through your mind? Would you believe that he was thrown in and look for the killer? Or that he was a troubled kid who followed after his brother, who also took his life? This is the truly tragic case of Joshua Maddox. If you're ready for it, let's dive into the case of the teen whose body was found in a chimney seven years later. Today's story begins in Woodland Park, Colorado. This peaceful 7,000 people town was home to Joshua Maddox. He was born on March 9th, 1990 and grew up with his dad, Michael, his brother, Zachary, and his two sisters, Ruth, and Kate. It was a pretty big family, but they were all close to each other. Josh was homeschooled for two years, but eventually he enrolled in Woodland Park High School. Josh had always been into music, and by the time he was in high school, he had become a talented guitarist. He'd spent most of his spare time jamming with his friends or writing. In high school, he also created a series of comic strips and shared them around the school. But in 2006, tragedy struck. Josh's older brother, Zachary, took his own life. He was only 18. The whole family took a big hit. And for Michael, it was clear that his children will never be the same again. In May 2008, Josh was 18 years old. Although he had never fully recovered from losing his brother, all his friends and schoolmates described him as a jolly guy with a great sense of humor. He was kind of described as like this funny guy, like a, a guy with a good sense of humor that kind of was just well liked by everyone. Like everyone thought he was kind of an awesome kid. Josh was a big fan of the outdoors and would often go walking or hiking by himself. This behavior started after Josh lost his brother. When he became the free spirit towards the end of his life, that was actually after his brother took his own life. So he just wanted to be with nature a lot and he just kind of um, became a lot quieter. On May 8, 2008, Josh told his sister Kate that he was going out for a walk. He never came back. Because Josh often kept to himself and went out for long walks on his own, his family didn't think much of it at first. But as he didn't come home that day at all, his dad Mike started to worry. I got up one morning and Josh was there. Then he never came home. The next day he still didn't come home. I called his friends. Nobody had seen him. Nobody knows where he is. Josh's family juggled two thoughts. On the one hand, he should be fine. It's not unlike him to be in nature. On the other hand, he's never been away for so long. Something's wrong. Finally, on May 13th, five days after Josh left, Mike called the police and reported his disappearance. The police searched for Josh through every nook and cranny of Pike National Forest. But days turned to weeks, turned to months, and there was no sign of Josh. The last person he spoke to was his sister Kate when he left his home for the last time. Kate eventually wrote a post on Facebook about her brother. Since Josh was 18, it has been reasonable to assume he might have decided to leave town to start a new life. As one of his two older sisters, I have always chosen to believe that this was the case. I have expected Josh to return home to my father's house at any time with a wife and small children. Maybe we would find him playing music with a band on tour or catch him writing successful novels under a pen name so that he could keep his preferred lifestyle of solitude in the woods. This may sound like wishful thinking, but just like Kate, nobody else had reason to suspect foul play. Josh never got into fights, he was never part of any sketchy gangs, and his high school knew him as an all-around good guy with excellent grades. The story of Josh starting a new life became the running story for his family. Mike even kept the family's old house in case Josh ever decided to return. On August 12th, 2015, seven years had passed since Josh's disappearance. The Maddoxes had accepted that Josh had left them, but they were about to get a piece of very tragic news. Chuck Murphy, the owner of a local construction company, 
decided to demolish one of his old cabins in the woods. Neither him nor anyone else had visited the place in over a decade, and he figured he would start over with that patch of land. The place was damp, it smelt like hell. There was raccoon poop all over the place. We really had no reason to go there except to tear the building down. When the builders broke down the chimney, they found Josh's remains stuck inside. As they dismantled the chimney and reached the interior, Chuck made the horrifying discovery of the body of a young man cramped into a fetal position with his legs above his head. Josh was crammed inside the chimney upside down, about a meter above the ground. The remains were so decomposed, the builders described them as mummified. Chuck quickly called the police who arrived at the scene with the county coroner. With the help of a forensic odontologist, they identified the remains as Josh's via dental records. The cabin was less than half a mile from his home. The news devastated Josh's family. The brutal reality of his disappearance had finally hit them. He wasn't living anywhere, making music or writing books. He had died a lonely death as soon as he left home in 2008, with no one to hear him or save him. The news of Josh's discovery quickly made the headlines around the country, but the case was far from closed. In fact, there were more answers than questions. The body was found to be wearing a thermal shirt only. That was the only item of clothing. The body was naked from the waist down. Had this been a tragic accident? At first, that's what Kate thought and wrote on Facebook. The situation doesn't make any sense at all. We were really expecting him to be anywhere else in the world, and he was actually very close. The only thing we can figure is he was being an 18-year-old kid, checking out a cabin. It had already been abandoned for a long time and a horrible accident happened. The police looked into any factors that could have led Josh down that chimney. Had he used illegal substances? Did he go up there with a few friends, challenging each other to climb on the dangerous cabin? Did someone push him inside? But there were no signs of any of these. Al Bourne, the Teller County coroner, did an autopsy and found no evidence of any drugs in Josh's system. In fact, he found no evidence of anything whatsoever. He declared, the hard tissue showed no signs of trauma. There were no broken bones, no knife marks, there were no bullet holes. There is so far no answers to a number of things. It is very confusing. If there were no signs of trauma, could it really have been that Josh jumped into the chimney by himself? But if he wanted to take his own life, there were just about a thousand quicker ways to do it. Tragically, Josh suffered a long and painful death. According to the coroner, he died of hypothermia. He was alone, in pain, and too far away for anyone to hear him scream for help. The police concluded the case and decided the cause of Joshua's death was accidental. Joshua was out exploring on the day that he disappeared. He was an adventurous type, so he took to the roof of the cabin, climbed into the chimney, tried to get into the property down the chimney, and accidentally slipped on the way and unfortunately died. Accidentally. But Chuck Murphy wasn't pleased with this scenario. He released his own statement, which went straight against the coroner's statement. Chuck had installed a thick rebar at the top of the chimney in 2005 when he took over the property from his parents. This was three years before Josh died inside the chimney. The rebar was meant exactly for preventing creatures from getting into the property via the chimney. This is what Chuck said in his statement. There's no way that guy crawled inside that chimney with that steel webbing. He didn't come down that chimney. Also, Chuck's specialization is construction, so it's pretty likely he knew what he was talking about when he released that statement. Although he didn't live inside the cabin, Chuck often visited it as he kept it as storage. He would have probably known if the rebar was gone. There's another disturbing detail. Remember that Josh was found inside the chimney only wearing his thermal shirt? It gets weirder. His other clothes were found neatly folded inside the room of the fireplace. This means that one way or another, Josh was inside the cabin before going up or down the chimney. And finally, Chuck Murphy noticed that the breakfast bar had been ripped away from the wall in the kitchen 
and placed alongside the fireplace. Was someone trying to block Josh from coming out of the chimney? Even with all of these brand new details available, the police still ruled Josh's death as an accident. But their scenario made zero sense. If Josh had died by accident, this means he would have entered the cabin, took off most of his clothes, folded them neatly and put them down, then went out onto the cabin's roof, removed the rebar, and crawled inside the chimney head first. How could the police overlook the absurdity of this scenario? As the police seemed to ignore any other options apart from accidental death, tips started pouring in, but they were mostly people sharing their opinion on the case. Once the police received a call from an 18-year-old who said he heard someone say, I put Josh in a hole. This tip was initially ignored, and Josh's case remained closed. But a few years later, one of Josh's former classmates posted on Reddit, I went to high school with this skinny, dorky hippie named Andy who played guitar in a band. I was never good friends with him or anything, but a year or so after I graduated, one of my good friends, Josh, started hanging out with him and then went missing. Last I heard, Andy was telling another friend, yeah, me and Josh have been spending a lot of time together. We're planning a trip to New Mexico. Didn't really think anything of it until somebody showed me these articles. Indeed, Josh's friend didn't suspect Andy when Josh disappeared in 2008 because he had no idea what Andy would end up doing. Andrew, Richard Newman, and Josh went to high school together and jammed together for a while. Josh never made it to New Mexico, but Andy did. In May 2009, Andy befriended a man called James in a bar in Albuquerque. They had a few drinks together and Andy asked James if he could crash at his place that night. James agreed and they left together with James's disabled friend. When they got home, James went to take a shower. When he came back into the living room, his disabled friend was dead. He had been stabbed in his wheelchair and Andy was gone. Andy proceeded to run away from New Mexico and enter Texas. There, he wandered the streets of Houston, going door to door, asking people for food and water. A Houston resident came home one day and found Andy in his living room. He came home and found Newman alone in his house with his 15-year-old son and 17-year-old daughter, acting strangely. The man took Andy to the police station. His fingerprints matched those at the crime scene in Albuquerque. When he learned this, Andy confessed to another a woman in Taos, New Mexico. He claimed that he her and stuffed her body in a barrel. However, the police in New Mexico already had a suspect, so the case was dropped from Andy Newman. Yeah, the police decisions in this story simply don't make a lot of sense, do they? So Andy spent a few years in prison. Then in 2012, he was arrested again with seven charges, including assaulting a police officer. Then he was arrested twice more. Finally, in December 2018, Andy was arrested in Brazos County, Texas. He'd assaulted three police officers and fled Florida as a fugitive. Currently, he is in a Texas prison. But let's return to Joshua Maddox. He disappeared in 2008, shortly after coming to know and play music with Andy. And let's consider all the facts. Josh told his sister he was going out for a walk on May 8, 2008. A walk. He was most certainly planning to come home that evening. Then the coroner's examination revealed no signs of trauma to the body, such as knife marks or bullet holes, but asphyxiation could not be ruled out. It's likely Josh was strangled. Then there's the details about the clothes. Why was Josh undressed? Was this a sex crime? Did the killer try to humiliate him? Finally, after the killer disposed of Josh's body up the chimney, he tore the breakfast bar from the kitchen wall and placed it in front of the fireplace. He didn't want Josh to get out. People around the world have been debating this case and pointing their fingers towards Andy Newman, frustrated that the police are refusing to reopen the case. One Reddit user commented, this is beyond frustrating. Andrew Richard Newman is the killer. And not only that, Somebody else is serving time for a murder he did and admitted to. I don't get it. The more I type about this, the angrier I get. Luckily, Andy is serving time in jail now. Unfortunately though, it isn't for killing Josh, as the police still consider Josh's death accidental. It seems like Josh's family will never get the closure that they want. It's a deeply tragic story made even more tragic by Mike 
losing both of his sons at the tender age of 18. With no justice brought for Josh, the only thing we can do is remember him as the fun, creative, and kind person he was. And that is the truly upsetting case of Joshua Maddox. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Anna Solves. Hey, don't be shy. Give this video a like and subscribe. And if you can take it, why not check out these other disturbing cases? Have a good night, stay safe, and take care of each other. It's scary out there.